Once again, we welcome you to today's webinar. This is Graphene and Other 2D Electronic Systems. This webinar is brought to you by the NAC Network, established at Pennsylvania State College of Engineering and funded in part by a grant from the National Science Foundation. Your moderator today is Mike Lasecki of Maytech. Hi, Mike. Hey, thanks very much, Roxanne. Hi. I'm sitting here today at the Maricopa Advanced Technology Education Center, and sitting right next to me is our colleague and today's presenter, Trevor Thornton. As you can see, Dr. Thornton is a professor of electrical engineering at ASU. But Trevor, tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you get interested in this nanotechnology stuff? Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, how did I get interested? Well, I, I did my PhD in this area, what, 25, 30 years ago, and it was all about finding better ways to make better computer chips. And a lot of the focus was on these two-dimensional electronic systems. And over those 25 years, I've been, my direction has changed somewhat from basic physics, really, to devices and now to circuits. So we're trying to build more efficient computer chips today. Cool. Uh, so, yes, well, I'd like to thank everybody who's joined now, and I'd like to thank those of you who download and listen to this webinar at a later date. Thanks for spending time with us. So I guess if we move to the next slide. And folks, you'll hear uh, Dr. Thornton, Trevor, and myself talking back and forth today. It's more like a conversation. You'll hear both of us chiming in. Uh, a little bit different format for the webinar. Go ahead, uh, Trevor, and tell us about graphene and these 2D systems. So, Mike, I remember when we were planning this months and months ago, uh, you asked me a topic that I'd be interested to, to present. And the notion of looking at graphene was exciting to me because, as, as I mentioned, although I'd worked with 2D electronic systems for a number of years, I'd never really worked with graphene. So this was a good opportunity to spend some time and put some slides together and, and, and talk about recent developments. But the thing I quickly realized was that there's been such an explosion in graphene research with literally billions of dollars of years invested in basic R&D that these slides are really going to be just a 30,000 foot sure. view of, sure. of the subject. But I hope I provided enough uh, links to other sites so that people who are interested in learning more can can uh, explore for themselves. So yes, let's move to the next slide. So 2D electronic systems, why are we interested in these? Well, it turns out, of course, that we're already completely dependent on 3D electronic systems, three-dimensional electronic systems. And the uh, photograph in that right-hand corner, of course, that shows the, that's a high current uh, copper wire that would be used to supply significant amperage to a, a stoves or a, a air conditioners. And in, in the copper wires there, the, the current is carried by electrons that are free to travel in three dimensions. Well, that's a three-dimensional thing that we're looking at there. So we're used to, you know, we have 3D copper wires in our house, and it turns out Surprisingly, maybe, we're actually very dependent on two-dimensional electronic systems. So those are, those are in our computer chips and cell phones. And in these systems, the current is confined to flow in a very thin sheet of charge. And the, the cartoon at the bottom there is a cross-section through a, a CMOS switch. So that's a transistor. We call them CMOS. Uh, those are the transistors that are in our computer chips, and they control the current that flows from a drain to a source. And the current flows in that red dashed line that I've indicated. That's a two-dimensional sheet of charge. So the current flows from the drain to the source in that very narrow sheet, and it's controlled by a voltage we apply to the gate. And if I apply a voltage to the gate, I can turn on the current or turn it off, and that's how I make my electrical switch. And it turns out that that, that two-dimensional sheet is very two-dimensional. It's only the, the width of the electronic charge is only something like 10 nanometers plus or minus a few nanometers. And although the current can flow easily within that sheet, it's almost impossible for the current to flow perpendicular and leave the transistor through the gate. That requires 
quantum mechanical tunneling and a bunch of other stuff. And so there's very little current flows vertically. So we really do have a, a two-dimensional sheet of charge. So that's our two-dimensional electronic system. So then the question is, how do we make a better two-dimensional electronic system? If I want to make a better transistor switch for my computers and my cell phones, I need to have a better two-dimensional electronic system. And so this is the only equation I'm going to show. All right, so the bolded in the middle there, the, this equation relates the conductivity, the Greek symbol sigma, to the product of N, which is the electron sheet density, E is the electronic charge, and mu is the electron mobility. So if we go through those three terms, the uh, electron sheet density, remember now we're, we're considering a, a, a thin sheet of charge. So we're, we want to count the number of electrons per square centimeter. And in our CMOS transistor, that switch I showed you earlier, we have, a, we have a large density. Look at that number, 10 to the 13 per square centimeter. That just reflects the number of atoms, really, that we have in each square centimeter of a surface of silicon. But it's a big number, 10 to the 13 electrons per square centimeter. The next term, E, is that electronic charge. That's just the charge carried on an electron, and that's a sort of constant in nature, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It is, that is the unit. It's just coulombs, isn't it? It's just not coulombs. Is it? That's the unit of charge. Just the unit of charge. How much charge does one electron carry? And of course, we have lots of electrons, so we can get quite a lot of charge in total, but each one contributes a relatively small charge. Right. And then the final term in there is that Greek symbol mu for electron mobility. So this is an interesting uh, uh, commodity. It's really just the velocity that the average electron would have in an electric field of one volt per centimeter. And if I go back to that silicon CMOS switch, its mobility, the electron mobility in those switches is anywhere from about 300 to 600 centimeters squared per volt seconds. So those are kind of funny units, centimeters yeah, squared per volt seconds. But if I take that mobility and I multiply it by a electric field of one volt per centimeter, then I get the sensible units of velocity, and I get a velocity of 500 centimeters per second. Huh. So that's pretty small, right? 500, that's five meters per second. So we could just about run that fast, or maybe an athlete could yeah. run almost that fast. So it doesn't sound like a very big number, but the point is that in our computer chips, the electric fields are huge. So now I could have an electric field approaching 100,000 volts per centimeter. Hmm. So now I multiply 500 by 100,000, and I get a very big velocity. So that's where, that's where the conductivity comes from. It's the product of those two big numbers, the n and the mu, uh, and the electric field. And of course, the, the mu becomes big because of the large electric field. So all right, so now if I look at that number, the numbers I get for that conductivity, I can't change the electronic charge. Uh, I can only change the sheet density n and the electron mobility mu. So I've given you those numbers for CMOS. If I want to do better than that, I need to explore new materials. And that's really where this explosion of two-dimensional electronic systems has come from, new materials that can give us higher conductivity, better computer switches. All right, so be before we go into graphene, let's look a little bit at the history of these new new materials that have emerged recently. And a lot of them, uh, have the first few we'll talk about are all based on, they're all carbon-based materials. And it's very interesting, isn't it? We've, we've known about coal and diamond for centuries and graphite. So these are all, when I went to school, these were the three elemental forms of carbon that we were taught. Everybody knew that. Yeah, yeah. coal, diamond, and graphite. And then in 1985, there was this kind of explosive discovery by these three folks. And essentially, they discovered this new form of carbon that was a molecule that consisted of 60 carbon atoms. And so it's, there's no hydrogen there. There's no oxygen. It's just an arrangement of 60 carbon atoms bonded together. And the, the, the cartoon I showed there I, I, read, I read some interesting essays by Harold Croto. He was, a, he was a professor, I believe, at the University of Southampton in the UK. 
and they they done the the measurements that allow them to determine that these this new material they'd found had 60 carbon atoms, but they weren't sure of its molecular structure. They had some idea. And the essay described how Harold Crono was sitting in his fireside chair looking into the coals of this coal fire, and he saw this image appeared to him of essentially a soccer ball. And from that, he realized that he could construct a carbon-60 molecule that would resemble things we recognize as a soccer ball. And they have resemblance to these geodesic dome right. structure that right. this famous American architect, uh, but Mr. Fuller, used to design with. And so they're, they're called now Buckminster Fullerenes, or more commonly Buckyballs. And interestingly, they are a natural product of burning carbon and having soot. Uh, so it's, they've probably been around a lot longer than they were originally discovered, but clearly only in very small quantities. So. So the discovery was, was identifying these things in large enough quantities that they could identify some molecular structure as carbon-60. Yeah, many of our students think Buckmeister Fuller must be some nanotechnologist and said he was this architect. Some of our forward-thinking sociologists, too, as well, as I think. Anyhow, just a little side note there. Sure. Let's go ahead. So that was 1985, and so now move forward for six years to 91. Uh, a scientist, I think he worked in the Japanese company NEC, Ijima, mm -hmm. he reported the discovery of hollow tubes of carbon that resulted from the, the sort of ash that formed when an electric spark was generated between graphite electrodes. So again, naturally occurring in soot, he found these very long tubes of carbon that were extremely narrow. and that caused a great deal of interest, and people began to do studies, and they found that they had very remarkable properties, one of them being that they can support huge current densities. So that number I have there is, what, what is that, 4 times 10 to the 9? So 4, yeah. four gigaamps per square centimeter. So that's about a 1,000 times larger than good metals like copper can support. Now, it turns out they're one-dimensional conductors. And again, if we look at that cartoon that I have there, uh, it resembles a, if you were to imagine a sheet of carbon atoms that are hex, hexagonally bonded together and then rolled up into a tube, that's our carbon nanotube. And they come in a number of different forms. I can have single nanotubes like pictured there, or we could have sort of nested nanotubes one inside another, and those are called multi-walled carbon nanotubes. But essentially, rolling up a sheet of carbon atoms hexagonally bonded would produce those carbon tubes. So this is a kind of segue now into the, the uh, oh, I'm sorry, that'll come later. Let's talk a little bit about how these things look when we first produce them. Uh, that image there shows that they're typically formed as, as bundles of threads. Uh, I think in the bottom left-hand corner, we can see the scale bar. That's a two micron scale bar in the image. So we can picture that these nanotubes are very, very narrow. This picture also shows how long they are and how twisted together they become. One of the big challenges was isolating individual nanotubes and measuring their electrical properties. So you can imagine looking at that picture why that might be a hard thing to do. People have now found ways to grow nanotubes from uh, catalytic seeding so that we can grow individual nanotubes and, and measure their properties. So uh, a lot of interesting applications. I've listed three on this slide. So with their high conductivity, maybe we could use them to make better interconnects to wire together the transistors on our computer chips. You can imagine that's quite challenging if I want to take that bundle of threads and use them for individual wires. It might be quite challenging. On the other hand, if we look at the picture, you can see there's an enormous surface to volume, surface area to volume ratio. It's about what's that a scale? Oh, I see it's three microns down here. Yeah, two okay. or three microns. So yeah. large surface area to volume. So maybe they'll make good catalysts. People may are thinking maybe I can I can absorb hydrogen onto the surface for energy storage. Maybe I can use them for novel battery 
connections for energy storage, and maybe they'll make better solar cells for energy generation. And then being made from carbon, they're relatively benign, and so people are looking at them for biomedical applications. But if we move to the next slide, I think probably the applications that are already out there are based on the remarkable mechanical properties of these nanotubes. So here's a, a table that I borrowed from Wikipedia, and it's based the, the source of all things. The source of all things, certainly for yeah. my students, that's yeah. right. Uh, the, the, uh, the columns are these uh, strength parameters, if you like. So there's Young's modulus, uh, the tensile strength, and then the elongation. How long can I stretch something before it breaks? And then the first four rows are these different forms of carbon nanotubes. So SWNT is just a single walled nanotube, and that's the one I want to focus on. That's the picture we had earlier. So the Young's modulus is approximately one okay. terapascal. Uh, the tensile strength is 13 to 53, and I can stretch them maybe 16% before they break. So now if we go to the, the last two rows, we compare them to things that we are a little bit familiar with. So they're stainless steel. So the Young's modulus of a single wall nanotube is about five times that of stainless steel. Its tensile strength is anywhere from 10 times or more. Mm -hmm. And I can stretch it maybe two or three times as well, I can stretch my carbon nanotube almost as much as I can stretch my stainless steel. I don't so think of stretching stainless steel 16 percent. Yeah, well, fine. okay, maybe you can, and it still will hold together. Maybe, okay. maybe. So you can see the the mechanical strength of that single wall nanotube is 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 even more than stainless steel, a uh, you know a tough material that we understand from our day-to-day -day lives. And then Kevlar, of course, is this sort of man-made fabric that is used in uh, lots of applications, including body armor and bulletproof vests. And you can see that uh, the Young's modulus and tensile strength of single wall nanotube is significantly more than Kevlar. And so mm -hmm. some of the first applications of these nanotubes are using it as a very high strength fiber material for uh, body armor and personal protective clothing. You know, Trevor, you might address this coming up. We've got a question in the Chat window, are these things expensive? Uh, maybe you're going to be talking about how to make these, but do you, any, any no, we can, we can talk about that? about that now because one of the things that has impressed me most is how the development of carbon nanotubes has come to the point where it's now manufacturable. Those first few pictures I showed you, people would essentially burn an electric arc through carbon and then plow through the soot and dig yeah. it out and look, find them using high power microscopes. Now they found ways to grow these nanotubes using uh, gas sources. And I've seen videos of it blowing out carbon nanotubes, almost like you see in the cotton candy at oh, the yeah, fairgrounds. At the fair, yeah. Yeah. Many of you might remember seeing pink strands of cotton candy coming out of one of these machines. Well, now people have a manufacturing process that will produce uh, carbon nanotubes in a, in a similar sort of way. So I, I think the cost is coming down to the point where they'll be very, very commercially manufacturable. Okay. All right, so we've talked about buckyballs, we've talked about nanotubes, and then in 2004, these two folks, these two guys in the University of Manchester, I should get somebody to tell me how to say their names properly. Yeah. Yeah. Andre Game and Kostya Novoselov. That's pretty good. That sounds pretty good. That's a good guess. People can correct me if they know better. Uh, they were able to isolate single sheets of uh, carbon, uh, which came to be known as graphene, and they did that using uh, pure graphite uh, material. So the question is, how do they do it? So the next slide is this. This is supposedly these are the items that uh, Andre Game presented to the Nobel Prize Museum to reflect the tools that he used with his colleagues to prepare the first exfoliated graphene. And so on the top left-hand corner, we've got a lump of graphite. And then, of course, in the center, we recognize the Scotch tape dispenser. And we'll talk in a minute how by a suitable use of the Scotch tape with the, the graphite block, they were able to isolate the individual graphene and put them in those electronic uh, test 
chips that Mike's indicated at the bottom there to do their first electrical measurements. This is Nobel Prize stuff. Huh? This is Nobel Prize. So it's interesting, isn't it? This this low cost initial demonstration generated a billion, multi billion dollar activity worldwide. So so let's understand a little bit about why graphite enables us to do this. So we've known graphite for a long time, of course. It's commonly used in our pencils. And graphite consists of these sheets of carbon atoms, exactly like I showed you in that cartoon. If you could roll up one of those sheets, you'd end up with a carbon nanotube. Now, this, in the, the, the graphite, those sheets are held together. They have strong covalent forces between the carbon in the same sheet. And then those sheets are held together by the relatively weak van der Waals forces that hold them together sort of perpendicular. Now, that's why pencils are good for writing with, right? Because they're fairly robust. They don't fall apart. But if I slide them across a piece of paper, I leave a dirty smudge behind, and that's my, my pencil mark. And it's because I'm gliding off layers of graphite onto the paper to leave a mark. So the, the notion of a single sheet of graph of carbon wasn't particularly revolutionary. But the, the thinking was that it wouldn't be stable by itself. That if I just had a piece of graphite film, one carbon atom thick, that it would be oxidized by the air yeah. and it would yeah. dissolve away somehow. And it just wouldn't be stable. So this is where the genius of these two folks at Manchester they came along and showed us a way to isolate graphite films. They called them graphene. And we could measure their electrical properties. So I think the next slide. This is a sort of cartoon that I stole from the Financial Times. And I will just run through this quickly. So the approach was to take my scotch tape and press it down onto the surface of my graphite. And the stickiness of the scotch tape is enough to make a few layers of the graphite adhere, and I could then peel them away from the graphite onto my scotch tape, and I would have a dirty smudge of scotch of graphite on my scotch tape. Now, the next trick is I don't want multiple layers of graphite. I want to isolate a single layer. So the trick was to then press my first layer of scotch tape with the multi layers of graphite onto another and then pull those apart. And now I begin to peel apart the graphite. And if I do that enough and in the right way, then I will end up with an individual layer of graphite, one atom thick, on my scotch tape. And I think the, the original demonstration, they put the scotch tape into acid, dissolved away the plastic scotch tape film, and left single layers of graphene floating on the surface of the acid, which they could then deposit onto a glass slide or silicon substrate. This cartoon here, and then a YouTube video that I think uh, Michael launch, suggests that we can take the graphene layer on the scotch tape, press it down onto a clean piece of silicon, pull away the scotch tape, leaving behind the graphene on the silicon. So Mike, are you going to be able to work your trick with the YouTube? Yeah, folks, let's try this. What I'm going to do now is launch a YouTube video First of all, you Macintosh users there, you may be blocked from seeing this, but you can click on it on the link I'm now going to place into the chat window. So bear with me for a second while we put that link in the chat window. OK, so there it is. There's the, uh, the YouTube link for you Mac users. Now, you other folks, you're going to see this. There's no sound, so Trevor's going to uh, narrate for us as we do this. Just a minute, Trevor, we'll get this going. OK, so it's playing now. So you can see they've got, I guess that's the, the graphite. So a relatively small piece of graphite. They're putting it down onto something that resembles scotch tape. And then this is the part that's kind of amazing, right? They they just repeatedly squish the sticky side of the scotch tape down on the, the the graphene, and eventually you'll begin to see the dirty smudge appears on the scotch tape. And it's that dirty smudge that's these multiple layers of graphene, one on top of the other. So there it is. That's quite clear. Yeah. 
And again, you know, most of us would just think, oh, I've got a dirty smudge of graphite, of graphite on my scotch tape. But again, that's why the Manchester folks were so smart. They recognized that, well, really, those are going to be multiple layers of, of, graph, of graphite. And I'm going to transfer them. So you can see him now. He's taken a small piece of silicon. Uh, he's pressing down to transfer the, the graphite that was on the scotch tape onto the silicon. And then when he peels it away, the dirty smudge that was on the scotch tape now gets transferred to my nice clean piece of silicon. And I think we zoom in and you can see eventually the, the dirty smudge. And I think he's going to transfer it over to a uh, microscope, microscope or something like that. So we could probably finish the, the YouTube at this point. OK, I'm going to jump back into our presentation. So yes, this uh, this is called mechanical exfoliation. I love it's a very, very very posh name for it, isn't it? Yeah. They're basically scraping off dirty smudges of graphite onto scotch tape, exfoliating it. Okay, got that in there. Here we go. Go ahead. So now you saw on the YouTube they were transporting the slide to a micro the silicon to a microscope. Here's a picture or something very similar. So now I've got these are layers of graphite, graphene layers, on a silicon wafer that's probably been oxidized to make the surface a good insulator. And Mike's pointing out the different pieces that are on there. And this is really the remark this is the remarkable uh, property of graphene that really allowed this discovery to happen, I believe. So you can see the shinier ones. I put the finger on the shinier pieces. These are the oh, yeah, these are the layers yes. of graphite. That, there's multiple layers there, and they're pretty much opaque. Oh, they're opaque. Yeah, and see, that's what they look like. Yeah, and so they reflect the light, and they look bright and shiny. But then the image shows a zoom into flakes of graphene that are now not shiny, but you can clearly distinguish them from the silicon that they are lying on top of. And the point to recognize here is that one of those layers of graphene is just a single layer. Probably the darker one is my guess. Oh, the darker Probably the darker one is the single. single layer. Oh, sure, that makes sense. And then if I move over to the slightly brighter layer next to it, that's probably a second layer of graphene. So that would be two layers of graphene. So the remarkable thing here is that I can see a sheet of carbon atoms, fractions of a nanometer thick, I can see those with the naked eye in a good optical microscope. By its, by its light uh, transmissive or absorptive yeah. property, it's pretty interesting. And we'll see later that it's because a single sheet of graphene can absorb 2 to 3 percent of light that goes through it in the visible spectrum. And, and that's why we can see it and then work with it. And I think this was the this is the remarkable thing that the Manchester group was able to exploit. Because now, if I can see this layer on my silicon surface, I can now use my standard microlithography techniques. I can put metal electrodes onto that sheet of graphene and begin to measure its electrical properties. So, Which one is the thicker one again? I'm guessing, I, I'm thinking the, the thin monolayer sheet is the blue one here that you've got the thinner that's, that's on. That's the thinner one here and thicker. Uh, it gets more opaque as you add more layers. I, I'm so. guessing. You know, I haven't looked at these myself. But so if anybody wants to correct us, we can, uh, okay. we can do that. But it's one or two monolayers as shown in that image. So kind of sure. remarkable that I can see. We can see those. It is. All right, so we've understood how this mechanical foliation works. And people have now found ways to grow graphene monolayers using chemical vapor deposition. So it's really a manufacturable process. But the question, the question now is, why is this thin sheet of graphene, why is it such a good conductor? And so I, I have this computer-generated image here of what a graphite sheet how the electrons and the carbon atoms are arranged. So the, the black spheres, the black marbles in that image, these represent the carbon atoms. The bonded, ones. OK, yeah, those ones right there. That's yeah. right, bonded together in their hexagonal symmetry. And then you can sort of make out around them a, a sort of transparent bubble. 
And that transparent bubble represents the electron charge associated with the carbon atoms. Mm. And the electron charge is kind of fairly dispersed and they're connected to charge clouds in neighboring atoms. And so it's that connectivity between the electron charge distribution that allows electric current to flow easily parallel to the sheet on both sides of the sheet. And again, this is the other remarkable thing. Until you'd seen it happen, many people would have believed that an isolated sheet of graphene would be unstable because chemical reactions would take place with the air, or it might be sure. stable, unstable to mechanical vibration. But here it is. And theoretical calculations have suggested that the mobility can approach values as high as 200,000 centimeters squared per volt seconds. So if we remember and compare that to the 500 centimeters squared per volt seconds for a silicon transistor switch, significantly larger. It is, yeah. Now, if you actually take that graphene layer and deposit it onto a silicon substrate, now the electrons begin to interact with the surface of the silicon, and that reduces the mobility to maybe 10 or 15,000, but still significantly higher than silicon can manage. So it's this combination of higher mobility with a high carrier concentration leads to the high conductivity and the excellent electronic properties that we've come to discover from graphene. Now, I'll be the first to admit, I was, I was kind of skeptical about the electronic possibilities for graphene. I was thinking that a single sheet would be so difficult to work with that it would be almost impossible to exploit its electronic properties for computer chips. And people, fortunately, people didn't agree. Other people didn't have the <laughs> same, same frame of mind as I did. And it sort of culminated. I was persuaded when IBM published a nice piece of work in Nature Communication. So IBM, they have, a, they have big chip manufacturing facilities on the East Coast. And so they, the picture on the left and the bottom there that Mike's pointing to shows a radio frequency integrated circuit built using standard CMOS processing. And these are the kinds of chips that we would have in our cell phones. And the largest features you can see on here are these kind of square, these are square spiral inductors. Mm -hmm. We need the inductors to provide us with matching elements for our uh, RF, RF circuits, that's right. Now, what the IBM folks did was they, they built all the transistors. They built these high performance passive components, we call them. Those are the capacitors and the inductors you need for your radio frequency, your radios. But then in the final steps, what we call the back end of line when the metal interconnects are put down, they used chemical vapor dip deposition to grow a sheet of graphene. And in the center picture, this is a nice picture. The purple, th this is a false color image. And Mike is pointing there to the graphene film. Now, in that image, the graphene is floating in air. And oh, yeah, it looks like it is. Yeah, yeah. and it, I think it really is. And that's because the, the, the chip manufacturers of IBM, they took the chip and they put it into hydrofluoric acid to dissolve away all of the oxides that would be there to support the graphene. And in this way, you can see the graphene. But it wouldn't be sitting there. It would be supported and, and uh, protected by oxide films below it and above it. Mm. And then, Mike, you can, just in, to show in context, that false color image there, that's the spiral inductor oh, that we pointed yeah. out in the first image. So oh, you can kind of see the scale. That's the thing over here. That's right. Is that. That's okay, a, good. Below a zoom in. Yeah. And then going back to the graph. Layer. Right here, yeah. This is where they use that graphene to make a radio frequency transistor, and they turned this into a 4.3 gigahertz radio. And there show it that it works. It's modulating over there. That's that's them modulating IBM. Those 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 uh, those oscillations. Those modulations represent the symbols IBM uh, at a carrier frequency of 4.3 gigahertz. So to me, this was very compelling because it showed you could take the properties of graphene and combine them with the very best of our computer manufacturing technology and end up with a radio frequency integrated circuit that depends on the graphene for its uh, performance. 
All right, so now this slide. This shows another remarkable thing about graphene. Unlike silicon wafers, which you can't bend before they fracture, graphene, we can imagine as a single sheet of carbon, is very flexible. And so people now are interested in using graphene for flexible electronics. Maybe I can take my graphene layer, just like the one that IBM used, but instead of putting it down onto a rigid silicon substrate, I could put it down onto a flexible plastic substrate with thin metal layers to make the electrical contacts. And now I've got a flexible electronic circuit that I could uh, imagine lots of applications. We could weave it into textiles. We could wearables. Use it yeah. Wearables. We could yeah. use it for uh, smart band-aids, for medical applications. So, so lots of interesting things. So flexibility is one thing. And then I think the next. Uh, the, the two other properties, of course, well, graphene has similar bonding to those carbon nanotubes, so it has a it has tensile tensile and mechanical strengths very sim similar to carbon nanotubes. And then the last bullet there is this interesting property that a single graphene monolayer can absorb. There it says 2.3 percent of light in the visible region. That's the reason we could see it. So maybe there'll be applications in optoelectronics or in uh, photovoltaics and yeah. energy production. So clearly, graphene is this remarkable material, electronic properties, mechanical properties, and optical properties. I'm still amazed by this 2.3 percent. I don't know. I've got to read the research here. I don't know how it does it yeah. uh, for a single layer. Yeah. It's, it's very fascinating. Let's go ahead. So now, now that people understood that we could make, take a group four material, group four in the periodic table, and turn that into a graphene single layer 2D system, people began to explore the other group 4 materials. So I have silicon and germanium. And so now people are postulating and beginning to demonstrate that maybe we can make two-dimensional sheets of silicon. We'll call that silicene. Silicene. OK, good. And then we'll take two-dimensional sheets of germanium and we'll call that germany. Now, these are of interest because we have this huge infrastructure in building silicon chips. We can put graphene onto silicon chips. We, we saw how IBM did that. But maybe it would work better if we could use silicon in the form of silicene on our silicon chips. And then likewise, germanium. Germanium is fairly closely lattice matched to silicon. The, the bonding distance is fairly similar. So maybe I can combine germanine and silicene and combine that with all of my silicon infrastructure to make very good uh, uh, future future computer chips. So a lot of er effort in that area. So and again, the pictures at the bottom there show silicene sitting on a uh, on a dielectric material that isolates it from the underlying. Well, that says silicon. zirconium dielectric right yeah. there. Okay. And then underneath that is my silicon substrate. So again, pretty similar conceptually to the graphene approach. So then. Uh, all of this excitement with two-dimensional graphene led people to look for other two-dimensional systems. And the motivation there was that the graphene is such a good conductor that it typically behaves in a metallic way. And what we'd like to do is convert that to a semiconductor material. And, and people can do that. We can convert graphene into a semiconductor. But, <coughs> excuse me. It turns out that there are other materials, and one of them is this molybdenum disulfide, or just molydisulfide, that is another two-dimensional sheet, but it is intrinsically semiconducting, and that lends itself to making two-dimensional transistors more easily. Well, I see over on the right here, there's the moly layer right there in your gate structure. And that's a, a, a sort of three-dimensional version of that two-dimensional cartoon that I showed of a, of a CMOS transistor. I've got my source, my drain, and my gate. Current flows from the drain to the source through that molybdenum disulfide, and it, the current is switched on and off by that mm -hmm. top gate electrode. Mm -hmm. So again, using the and, it, and I, molybdenum sulfide again has uh, better semiconducting properties than silicon, and so maybe I can use this to make a, a better transistor switch. So then. Now we move on to some other two-dimensional electronic systems that are really quite exotic. 
So, and again, they're given this fancy name, a topological insulator. So we know what an insulator is, right? That's a material that doesn't conduct current very easily. Topological refers to shape and space. And so topological insulators are materials that behave as insulators in the bulk, but either their surface or the interface between the material and another material, that interface or that surface can have very good electrical conductivity. So the early demonstrations of these topological insulators involve these uh, semiconductor materials, mercury telluride, cadmium telluride, and they were sandwiched together to form what we might call heterojunctions or quantum wells. And it's really the interface properties that we were interested in rather than the bulk. And then if we move on to the next slide, uh, again, I, I don't want to dwell on the details of this slide. It's really there to show that this field of topological insulators is kind of exploding into lots of different material systems that are listed there. They have different electronic properties re related to their band gaps. Uh, some of them are the original cadmium telluride and mercury telluride, and then we have other uh, germanium lead bismuth. So there's a lot of excitement that these new materials provide us with a, a kind of cookbook or an alchemy in which we could tailor design two-dimensional systems that have electronic properties that we design in advance. Mm. So lots of work, lots of opportunities here to take what we know about existing 2D systems and develop them further. And then I think we're coming towards the end of the slides. Mm. This, this slide uh, gives, again, a cartoon representation of a different kind of transistor switch that we might be able to use with these topological insulators. Now, the, the traditional silicon switches that I was talking about up till now, they simply switch off the flow of charge to control the current. And of course, they work very well, but they have the possibility, they have significant power dissipation. The current flows through a resistor, and so I get a I squared R volt power loss, and that power is essentially wasted. One of the interesting things about electrons other than its charge is the fact that it has this quantum mechanical property that we call spin. You can liken it a little bit to a, a magnet or a compass pointing in a particular magnetic field. And so the electron can exist in two states, either spin up or spin down. And maybe I can use that spin state to convey information to do my one and zero. To do my ones and zeros, thank yeah. you, but in a way that uses much less power, much lower power dissipation. And so now this final picture at the bottom shows how with these topological insulators, I similar construction, I have a source and a drain, but now instead of being good conductors, these are ferromagnetics. That's what the FM stands for. Oh. So I have a, a good magnet, a strong magnet, and that magnet wants to align all these electron spins in the up direction. And so maybe now my electron spin can propagate from the source to the drain with spin up, and maybe that conveys digital one. But now with a, a, a gate voltage applied, I can rotate the spin direction so that the electrons that leave the source with a spin up reach the drain with a spin down, yeah. and that represents maybe my digital one, or vice versa. Yeah, right. So now I can use topological insulators, exploit the electron spin, and use that to do my one and zero digital computation with much lower power dissipation. So again, very exciting stuff. That's some way off in the future, but there's a lot of effort going on there to demonstrate this. All right, so I think we're just coming up to our last summary slides. Uh, we'll see that 2D electronic systems have been around for decades. Uh, they exist in our, the world we live in, in our computer chips. We use them all the time. But rather than sort of stagnating, they're really growing in importance now. We're, we're looking for applications in graphene. We're looking for these topological insulators. And not only for the electronic chips that I focused on, but you know, textiles, uh, healthcare systems, 
energy generation and storage. So lots of exciting things we can look forward to in the, in the decades to come and, and in the near future as well. Trevor, we'll encourage folks to put any questions they might have in the chat window. There's several that have come in by email. Um, is this all just in the lab? Is, it, is any of it emerged yet at scale, or is it just research projects? I mean, um, you know, you know what I mean. Yes, no, that's a, that's a good question. Certainly, the the uh, high volume production of carbon nanotubes is allowing. I think the government, the, the U.S. Army, has contracts to buy. Uh, body armor that uses carbon nanotubes that's better than the Kevlar. So, so those things are already in place. I think we're going to be very quickly integrating carbon, these two-dimensional systems, into silicon chips. And you know, I'm excited to see what happens with the biology. So I think from the electronic point of view, a lot of it's in the lab, migrating from the research to the development side. I know, I know with a marker when we know it's happened. When you can buy a new hood for your Mustang that's made out of carbon nanotubes, you know, instead of these carbon fibers now. Or yeah. Maybe there's nanotubes in those fibers. You buy them, that'll be the indicator that, that we're doing this. And you can buy something at Walmart. That oh, has that's a, the true uh, has indicator. A graphene, but, yeah. graphene in it. Then we know that it's commercialized. I had another question, and it had to be uh, the, the word you know, you mentioned silicene and germanine, graphene. You know, that ene sort of means double bonds to a chemist. Is that right? Are there uh, oh, there you stopped me there. there. You're right. Yeah. Yes. No, I'm not I wonder where that came from. I think you must be right, but I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm not either. I'm just curious. I don't know why I thought about that. Okay, here's the last thing. Uh, let's take a, a, a quick look at a question that's come in from outside. Would the noise temperature be lower for an FET device over an HEMT? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, well, so wait, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, an FET is a field effect transistor. So that's the the cartoon I showed you where a gate voltage controls the current between source and drain. And then an evolution of that is this high electron mobility transistor. That's what HEMT stands for. So. I didn't. Th that's what I was working on when I was a graduate student. Gallium arsenide and aluminium gallium arsenide were the semiconductor materials that allowed, allowed you to build a high mobility transistor, and that's what the hemp is. And those, as the uh, Thomas, yes, Thomas uh -huh. is pointing out, those have the lowest noise. Uh, so for lots of applicants, radio astronomers like those because they produce the best images of space. Uh -huh. They're good for the highest performance communication systems because those hemp transistors have the lowest noise. My guess is, Thomas, that in a, a HERO experiment, you could exploit the higher mobility of graphene to give you a lower noise temperature and a lower noise. But whether you could do it in a practical device that you could deploy is another question. Before we go to our final question, folks, I'd like to uh, invite you. Oh, there's some cool images there. Uh, Trevor, remember, you're going to be getting links to all of these slides as well as the recording as well. I'm now going to, Roxanne, are you going to launch the survey? Uh, could you go ahead and do that, or am I going to do it? OK, you're going to do it. So folks, uh, Roxanne is launching the survey. It's just a couple of questions. And we use that survey to help demonstrate impact of these webinars to the National Science Foundation. Trevor, look at that second question. See, so we ask people, what do they do with this? Do they add new instructional material? Uh, do they create a new technology topic? So those are, that helps us understand the utility of this. That's sort of apropos for our other discussion. Yeah, that's a very that's, that's very useful feedback if people have time to complete this. So just click on that, and then while you're doing that, we'll just leave it up for a, mo a moment or two. Um, Trevor, here's a question. Okay, so many of us are not as involved in the research aspects as we are in the applications, and we tend those tend to be more focused on community college, tech level, technician level education. What do you think a technician ought to know about two-dimensional electronics today? Just the, the fundamentals of those material properties. What should I take into my class of, of what you've shown today? What would be, what's your recommendation? Well, I think the, so maybe not just two-dimensional systems, but these carbon-based materials, whether they're nanotubes or graphene, uh, we need to know how to manufacture those, and it's done using 
relatively standard techniques that we call chemical vapor deposition. Yeah. So I think having a good understanding of how the semiconductor industry works is important for us to understand how new materials that we've talked about today would be employed in chips of the future. And then manufacturing not just for chips, but for textiles sure. and and then, you know, measuring these things, you, you build something, but you then have to be able to measure their properties. So, you know, what are the classes you need to be able to measure mechanical strength and electrical properties? So I think there's lots of things that, uh, that we should be focusing on there. That certainly would be an area for technician interest, right? Metrology uh, is obviously one uh, understanding of everything from the, from the microscopy on to the other types of measurements. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. Folks, I, uh, uh, Roxanne, let's give a count. I'm going to count five, four, three, two, one. I didn't do it yet. And then we'll close the survey. So make your last little things. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Go ahead and close it, Roxanne. Thanks, folks, for participating in that. Now, let me remind you of what's coming up here. I've already mentioned that they're going to get the slides, Trevor. Oh, you can get a, there are participants can get a certificate. They can write to Sue Barger, S. Barger. She's at the Penn State Group, engineeringpsu.edu. She'll send you a, a, certific a certificate. You can put it on your wall. That'll be exciting. Uh, here's the upcoming things in the NAC network. August, God, that seems like it's coming up faster than I realized. Uh, at Penn State, nanotechnology course resources. That's the second. We have several levels here. They're talking about patterning, characterization, application. This is a very hands-on workshop. And then their uh, introduction one workshop is at Penn State in, uh, in College Park uh, in Pennsylvania in November. So that's cool. Uh, we would like to thank all of our uh, attend. Uh, we'll go ahead. Roxanne, do you see that? Would you post Sue Barger's uh, email in the, uh, in the window there, please, for us? Again, thanks everybody for being part of this today. I forgot to mention, Trevor. Let's look at that list of attendees. Where do we do? Where do we? Where do we put yes, it? Sorry, sorry. So, how many? How many states do we have represented here? Let's count them: three, six, nine, twelve. People from fifteen states. And listen to this, folks. This is un somewhat unusual, not totally for us. Uh, over fourteen foreign countries. People that have joined us from outside of the U United States today. So we thank you uh, very much for for being part of that. Uh, everyone, that concludes our official webinar today. Uh, we appreciate your interest. Trevor, thank you again. Well, thank you, Mike. Roxana, thank you for your help. And we're going on to mute.